So there was a man who lost his axe, and he was pretty sure he knew who took it. It was his neighbor's son. That kid, he walked like a thief. <laughs> he looked like a thief. He spoke like a thief. The man went into the valley to do some work. He was digging in the valley, and he found his axe. When he saw his neighbor's son again, he looked, and he spoke, and he moved about the world like any other child. Isn't that funny how we do that? We are so sure, right? We know who did it. I remember years ago getting so frustrated all the time because there was always crumbs on the countertop. You know, it's just like, oh, I was so mad at my partner. So always leaving all these crumbs on the countertop. And then one day she was on vacation and there were crumbs on the countertop. <laughs> This is where it all comes back, right? <laughs> over and over again, the responsibility. Jesus said, why in the world would you try to remove the speck from your neighbor's eye when there's a log in your own? Right? So we must remove the log from our own eye first. And maybe the speck from our neighbor's eye will get removed, and maybe it won't, but the truth is it's none of our business. What is our business is our work. Right? And as we do our work, it does have an effect in the world around us. And we see that as we do practices such as these, the self-identity through Ho'oponopono. So this practice, for those of you who are just joining us, is very much the chant that we did during the meditation, these four phrases. And um, it comes to us from Morna Simeona, who, after noticing kind of the Western mind, um, thought that this form of Ho'oponopono, rather than the traditional form, would be most useful to us and would work the most with our modern lives to be able to really take it as an inward practice. So, so that's the practice that we're looking at is self-identity, Ho'oponopono. And, you know, I think for a lot of us, when we um, do the practice, or at different times in our lives, we might be in that, you know, attitudinal space sometimes, like, apologize. You ever get there? Like, why should I apologize? <laughs> right? Because it's clearly somebody else has done whatever you know they did. So why should I apologize? Why am I apologizing? You know, so so and and actually we have done something because we have judged someone else, right? When we're in that kind of they did and you know, the finger pointing, the blame, the moaning, the groaning. That's, that's really what this practice helps us move out of because when we're in that space, we aren't at our divine best, right? We aren't in that beautiful alignment with the divine that allows the flow of life to happen through us. When we are in those flows, there is a, an easy connection, an easy feel of the peace and the love and the creativity that all of us usually want to experience. And so this practice offers us this very simple way. So whenever we judge another, whenever we're in discord or disharmony, or you know maybe it's just things going on in the world and we're in that place of, oh, that's awful and so-and-so is doing this wrong and this, you know, this is you know, a, a major catastrophe, whatever it is that we think is going on, then we can find ourselves in those places and go, oh, I could just practice Ho'oponopono. I could just begin to take 100% responsibility, not just for myself, but everything that has come into my awareness and work with it in this simple practice. So that's what we're really about in this series is kind of breaking this down and looking at how can this practice serve us and serve all of life? How can it open up the way of the divine to have its way with us, to bring forth the inspiration that is, is lying in wait, but often sort of blocked by all this other stuff, um, which the other stuff is really the subconscious mind, right? There are three phases of mind that we work with. We do this in unity, the trinity of mind. There is subconscious, conscious, and superconsciousness. Self-identity, Ho'oponopono, identifies those same phases of mind and an additional one called divine intelligence. In unity's teachings, we usually combine divine intelligence and superconsciousness. 
And so these three phases work together in this process. So what is in the subconscious mind is like what's in your basement, you know? It's just, it, it's the stuff that sort of piles up over time. It's all the memories, the perceptions, the beliefs that we form as a result of different things that we experience in our lives. And so we, go, we walk around sort of um, responding to the world from that place because the subconscious is unaware until it moves into the conscious mind and we become aware. And how does it do that? It does that through practices that reach into the superconsciousness. The practices that open us to the divine intelligence of the universe, that open us to the, the superconscious, the higher power of, of ourselves. And so it is, in, it, it is in this conversation with that that we say, I apologize, please forgive me. So it's not so much we're doing this with our friends and neighbors as we are doing it within ourselves with the divine in us, with these aspects of mind. And when we say these things, then the divine is, is accessible to us and the subconscious begins to release that which is no longer needed, that which is, is different from or is sort of disconnected from this wider truth of spirit. And so the, the old limiting ideas fall away. The old memories begin to be enlightened by this, this connection with the superconscious. And then whatever needs to become conscious then comes into our conscious awareness. Conscious awareness is, I know I'm here. I can feel you know, my arm. I'm, I'm aware that I'm in this, in this space. So whatever comes into that kind of awareness. So these are the phases that are being worked with while we do the prayer, the Ho'oponopono work. So um, really, when we get in the, out of the, the subconscious mind, when we're in that place of right doing, wrong doing, you know, this is, this is right, that's wrong, we, we kind of get, get in those stuck places. Rumi has a lovely sentence from one of his poems, Rumi the Sufi poet, that, that sort of lets us unwind that. He says, I, out beyond ideas of wrong doing and right doing, there is a field, I'll meet you there. And so you just that very poetically you can you know take that in and just recognize oh yeah you know, usually people say that when they hear that oh yeah either I, oh yeah I remember that one or oh yeah it lands you know in this way in our hearts because it lands in that place of oh that right that's right there is this field there is this other place there is this this knowing place where we meet one another in the place of of love right? In the place of gratitude, in the place of connection, in the place of oneness. Really, if nothing else, this, this practice has a real grounding in oneness. There's a sense of oneness in it. Even though the practice says it's your practice, it's a personal practice, it has sort of a, a, a basis of understanding that there is a sense of oneness that happens. That's part of Hawaiian spiritual teachings too, and it's part of our teachings in unity. This idea that everything is one. We are all one with spirit. We are one with each other. We are one with all life. All life forms both animate and inanimate. There is a sense of respect and honor for all of that. And so Rumi has yet another story where he, he goes to his beloved and he knocks on the door. And the beloved says, who's there? And Rumi says, it is I, your lover. And the beloved says, go away. There's no room for two of us in here. <laughs> and so Rumi goes away and he does his prayers and his meditations and he comes back and he knocks on the door again. And, and from inside you hear the voice say, who is it? And he says, it is you. And the door is opened with a warm welcome. So it's a part of this practice is a recognition that I am you and you are me and we are it, the it, the it of the, of the, the truth of God, right? And so when we release what is not that, we make space for what is, for wants to, what wants to be known. This is the self that is talked about in self-identity through Ho'oponopono. It is the self that, with the big S the divine self that we are working with. It's the little s too. <laughs> you know, it's the clearing of the little s, but it's really a coming into a self-identity that says, I am that I am. I am the divine, right? Our second principle, I am the divine. I love that I can just refer to them now on the wall. <laughs> and they're so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> the I am, 
You know, that is, that is the truth of who we are. So that's the big S self that we're, that we're beginning to identify with as we do this practice. We move from a practice that says, oh, I'm a lowly worm of the dust. Anybody ever hear that in their churches growing up? That was one of the favorite sermons in my church. Um, <laughs> To, to, you know, I, I'm not that. I'm not that lowly worm of the dust because I'm a creation of the source, right? So if we are a creation of the source made in the image and likeness of God, we are that I am. We are part of that I am. The only difference between us and all the masters is that we forget. And then we remember again. And then we forget. And then we remember again, right? So the more we practice, the less we forget. And the more we stay in the remembrance of who we are and act in that in that vein, in that way, in that flow. The more we begin to see our neighbors not as thieves, but as people, as children, as brothers and sisters, as part of our family, as in Hawaii, as they would say, ohana, part of our ohana. It's all part of that, that spirit of aloha. So I've been practicing. I want to make clear that this is all new to me. I'm no expert in self-identity, ho'oponopono. I read Zero Limits, one book, and started practicing very recently, <laughs> and um, I've had some really great experiences with it. And this week, one of them was, I like to swim laps, and so I was swimming laps one day, and um, there was a man standing, you know, this is kind of the, the way the etiquette generally works. Somebody begins to sort of encroach, get closer to the lane, and then sometimes wait to let you know they're getting in or ask you if they can share the lane. And I looked up and I thought, oh no, not that guy. <laughs> I, I don't want to share with him. I don't because, you know, he just, he floats through the lanes. He doesn't really swim laps. He seems sort of oblivious and, you know, and so I've seen him a lot, you know, at the pool. And so, so here I'm swimming, getting close and he's getting, oh, darn, he's getting in. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So then I come back around and I realize, oh, I could do Ho'oponopono here. And it's lovely because you're in the water. So it's just like, mm, just flows so lovely. So, you know, of course he's swimming like a dream. You know, he's in his lane. He's doing just fine. He's doing his laps. He's not, you know, doing any of the things that I projected on him. And so I start doing Ho'oponopono. And I didn't even have to get through all four phrases when it just went away. It's just like, I just didn't, you know, it was like, I didn't need to think about it anymore. It was gone. And so I'm swimming a little longer, and after a while, I've completely forgotten about that. Who knows what my mind is spinning on now, something else. And then all of a sudden, this thing pops into my mind. It's an old memory from college of this man who assaulted me in college. And he looks just like this guy. In fact, if you aged that kid from college to this man's age, that's how he would look, I'm quite sure. If Hollywood got a hold of him for a part to age him, he would look like this guy. And so I just realized, wow, you know, how interesting that this, this thing, I mean, I wasn't trying, but this memory just came back up, right? And then I would just, you know, just, just swam it out. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that, I don't know if that college trauma is completely gone, but at least a piece of it feels like it broke loose and it just sort of went away, you know, floated away in the waters of forgiveness. And, and so I could have, since that young age, held on to the anger around it, right? Or waited for the justice system to, you know, for so he could get his, or, or, you know, make sure the guy paid for, you know. I, I could be in that kind of frame of mind. That's a choice, right? We can be in that kind of frame of mind. Or we could just say, I take 100% responsibility for anything that happens in my life or anything that comes into my awareness, and I clean on it, as Dr. Hugh Lin, a teacher of Ho'oponopono, would say. I just, I just begin to say the words, I apologize. You know, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. And I can say that, you know, easily and effortlessly. And think of that young man, you know, who knows what was going on in his life. But it doesn't, it's not really even about that. It's just about paying attention to what comes in that spirit is bringing our attention to and working with it. We've got fodder in our world, don't we? We've got fodder for this practice. I mean, you don't have to look very far, you know. <laughs> I purposely went out to work in a coffee shop on my talk the other day, and I told Brenly when I got home, I went out because I knew my little judging mind would get busy at some point, and then I could work on Ho'oponopono. You know? <laughs> if I stay in the... <laughs> well, right? <laughs>
If I stay in the confines of my safe little sanctuary, you know, chances are I'm not going to have those thoughts. What am I going to judge little cute Dakota, my little dog? Oh, you shouldn't cuddle me that way? No. I need to go out and like have, you know, be in life, be in the world, be in places, you know, and, and this is part of our work, right? To, to be out in the world so that we can do our practices in real time and see the workings of our minds, and so we can release ourselves from those prisons. That's really what this is all about. So from doing this work this week, I also have had this wonderful little side benefit, which is that I have felt like my intuition is a lot sharper. And I think it's because, you know, you release something for your subconscious, the conscious mind is more available, so, so things should work that way. That is the way it should work, that there would be an opening, more divine inspiration. So it's a simple example, but this Thursday I was setting up for class, uh, for Unity Basics class, and Barbara Kane was here, and she said, do you want me to set up the chairs? I said, sure. And immediately I got, we had no sign-ups, I had no idea how many, and I just said, 13 chairs. It was just like, no thought about it. She said, okay, she put out 13 chairs. And so about 10 people showed up initially, and we were doing class, and a few more trickled in as we do. And, um, and I just happened to notice that 12 chairs were filled. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, because boy, 13 came really clear. And you know, within 10 minutes, the 13th person comes. <laughs> and oh, and I heard, actually, when I said that to myself, I heard another one's coming. So, you know, it, it's just, it's a small example, but I think Spirit gives us these examples when we need just a little more reassurance, a little more validation, right? This works, this stuff works, right? So we get that kind of opening, we get that kind of validation, you're on the right track. That's how I take that when I get that. You're on the right track, keep doing the work. This will be a, more available to you if you keep releasing, keep, keep up the self-identity, ho'oponopono. So... Um, Last week, another piece that came along in the, in the intuition piece was um, a, a woman came up to me afterwards and said, oh, thank you so much for reminding me, Ho'oponopono, just, I, I healed through that years ago, and I'm so glad I was reminded. And I just didn't even have to think about it. I said, will you share next Sunday? And she didn't have to think about it, and she said, sure. And it turns out it was her first Sunday. <laughs> so I want to invite Julie Cohn up to share with us. <laughs> oh, I think it has it isn't on yet. There you go. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> so thank you, brave soul, for just stepping right in. Thank you for asking. Me. Yeah, I don't know that it took any bravery. You seem like a natural at this. So um, tell us a little bit about how you came into the practice of self-identity, Ho'oponopono. How did this even happen for you? Well, I had lived with anxiety for much of my life. Even though I was also a joyous person, there was something underneath that was anxious. And when I reached menopause, it came to this fiery place where it just took over. The anxiety was really, really strong some episodes that were very difficult for me, and, and it basically sparked off what I believed was cancer. And so I had first stage breast cancer, and I thought, well, you know, they're telling me I don't have to have this lump out right away. I might go another route here, you know, try a little less conventional for a little while and see how that goes. So I went to a doctor. I just, it was really hard to make this decision, because I had many who didn't want me to do this. <laughs> and I went to Texas, and I learned Ho'oponopono there as a way of working through what I perceived as traumas in my life that had accrued over my life. And I wrote down these traumas and then addressed them with Ho'oponopono. And this naturopath taught them to you that was working with you? Yes, to heal, he right? did. Yeah. He was a naturopath and an MD, so he had the whole background. Wow. Yeah, it's nice. very amazing. Uh, a friend recommended him to me, somebody who had heard of him, and says, well, why don't you check him out? And then as soon as we talked, I went, oh, this is the guy I've got to see. Yeah. <laughs> so then he had you write down your traumas? Is that I wrote right? down 22 traumas that I perceived I had, right? Mm -hmm. And then we took them one by one, and I worked with him in therapy, and I also did a ponopono on my own. Like, he taught me how to do this in my own way. Mm. Yeah. 
And tell us a little bit about that. How well, did it I would, work? I would do a little butterfly. Can I show? What? Yes. Um, whatever the... So I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. And I did this with images in front of me. They were black and white images of whatever was the, the theme of... There were just maybe three where I actually did this with images, and they were the strongest traumas that I wanted to get through. Mm. One of them was holding on to my mother, who had, who had passed when I was 27 of cancer and not being able to separate from her, so I put her pictures in front. The other one was of, of Hitler and the whole German Holocaust because my father, who is still alive and basically was an orphan for a year because he fled his family from Germany, had really, you know, I guess somehow the DNA came into me of the, the fear of the Holocaust happening again, and I needed to move through this. Mm. Okay, so. so you just skipped over something really important. You said Hitler was included in your forgiveness process. Yes, he was. Tell us about that. Well, my husband, Michael, came to visit me because I was there in Texas for six weeks. And he was walking one day, and he said, oh, there's a great synagogue nearby. You should check it out. Well, he had to go the next day, so I went to the synagogue, and it happened to be that the rabbi there was a cantor as well. And, okay, I'm, I'm suddenly, what was your question again? <laughs> About, the, well, you did the forgiveness work. And, and how did you do the forgiveness work? You, you mentioned that you even forgave Hitler. Oh, yes, okay. Okay, I'm telling you the whole long story. I can, I can abbreviate this. So I met this woman there at the, church, at the uh, synagogue, and she went with me to the library because I was afraid to go by myself. And we looked through all the stacks and found all these books with images of what happened in the camps and what happened all in Germany when this was all fomenting, and even pictures of Hitler. And I took them and copied them on a copy machine in black and white. The idea was in black and white, not in color. It's, it's, a, it's a memory, it's not re real now, like it's just mm -hmm. something I wanna mm -hmm. shift out of you know, my consciousness as being real now. And then I did a ceremony with Ho'oponopono on my own, looking at each of these images, including one of Hitler, and I embraced the fact that Hitler himself was not aware of what he was doing. And I forgave him for that unconsciousness, or as Reverend Kristen is saying, the unconscious, that, or subconscious, mm -hmm. that, was, that he didn't understand about himself, the baggage. So I forgave that. And then I you know, burned the images with each one of these, I did this and then burned them and put it away to rest. I buried it. Mm. And I used a ponopono for giving every single one of these horrible things, forgiving these people, forgiving it. And it was like, wow, I'm letting go of this thing that I've held for so many years. Mm. It was amazing. Mm. Mm. Needless to say, you were healed of cancer, yes. and other uh, things happened along the way, such as a change in your artwork yes. as an artist. Do you need a minute to recover from this? No, I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support. Um, so, um, I found out my mother was an artist when I was 10. I had no idea I had any inkling of ability or interest in art. And my brother and sister had gone off. They were quite a bit older. So there I was with my mother doing art. And, um, and I was taught to do art as something to release, of something beautiful to look at, 
and also to ask people, what do you think? Do you like my work? Do you like me? You know, I couldn't even separate my art from me. It was like really hard. Like, but you don't like my art, then you don't like me. It was just crazy. So, you know, like, you know, I had to learn this is separate from me. This is my art. This is me. Okay, so what happened is I had a little bit of happening before I had cancer where I was doing some work from subconscious or, or you know, something was coming up and I was, it was scaring me. So I, I saw that I had the ability to let things channel through me and I was going, uh-oh, I'm not gonna touch that. Until I went to Texas with cancer, wanting to heal. So I'm gonna show you my little book. I went to a fair where this, did I turn it off? No, it's on. Okay. I went to a fair uh, in Eden, Texas where the rabbi, who was also a cantor, was singing. And I found these blank books, uh, these wonderful books. I bought a few in this small one. I said to myself, when I'm in the clinic healing, physically, emotionally, all the ways that I'm healing, I am going to start doing art for myself that has nothing to do with be outward beauty necessarily, just a journal of art. So I did this book, I worked on this book, and each particular painting was to help me move through my decision making around what I was going to do around cancer. It wasn't just, oh, tell me what to do, but what's my next step? Okay, this is what this doctor's saying, this is what this book is saying. This is, I really, really wanted to know for myself intuitively where I was gonna go to heal. And this book really helped me do it. And there was a title I would put after each one that would help me learn what my next steps were. Now, the very end of this book is a portent a flower. And I knew when I made this flower that I was going to heal. I said to myself, this is the last page in this book. I am healing, for sure. Like, I just told myself that. Mm. And that brought me to this painting. Mm. So I will share with you about that. Mm. <laughs> and this painting is a part of a series that has a panel mm -hmm. of paintings. So, so this painting is called No More Prisons. It took me about six months to make. It was around the two-year period, you know, one and a half to two years of having had the cancer and moving through it. And I started with a panel in the middle. And you can guess, oh, okay. You can guess which one was second, third, fourth, and fifth. And so each time I made this and worked with it, it helped me move through those fears. And I knew I was supposed to come out as this flower in the end. And here I am. This is the first time I have actually talked about this in front of a big group. Wow. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so one of the things as we take in this practice and all these beautiful examples and you know, and the synchronicities, you know, like Julie and I were talking about, you can't make this stuff up. Her, she got her book in Eden, Texas. I don't know if you caught that. <laughs> the doctor that she went to work with, a naturopath, was, was practicing a German practice of, of medicine with this ideas about cancer and, and so on. So, you know, it's, it's just, yeah, it's just good stuff. Divine order at work, right? So, and in Julie's story, you could hear that there's both the personal healing aspect, but there's also a collective healing process that, that goes on. She talked about how the prisons were not just for herself, but also the prison system and a freeing from our prison system, you know, of, of uh, changing around that. So, so all of the work has that ability to be both in the world and, and um, not of it, but yet connected to it, right? Connected to what's going on in the world. And I thought one of the ways that we can give back in our process, so we've been given this beautiful practice out of the Hawaiian spiritual tradition. One way we could give back is to join with native Hawaiians in prayers for their sacred mountain. You may have heard in the news about Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea is the largest mountain in the world. And there are native Hawaiians who are not protesting in their words, but protecting their mountain um, from an 18-story telescope 
that the university and governments around the world want to put at the top of that mountain, it would be over an aquifer, which is their, um, uh, wa which is a natural water source there. Among other many other reasons, Native Hawaiians are are not wanting this telescope to go up, and that's what's happening with those demonstrations of protection for the sacred mountain. So one of the ways I thought, if you feel moved around this and want to give back to Hawaiian natives and Hawaiian spirituality for this practice was to join with them in prayer. And uh, there's 12 beautiful prayers that were written by a person named Amalani. Um, and we have printouts of them. Mike has them at the door if you want to take one with you. I'll just read you one of them just so you can get a feel for it. There's 12 prayers, and it's designed to be used from sunrise to sunset. And they are for the mountain, for the sacred mountain. Um, it's, it's called Mana Kea. And she says to this one prayer, I pray that you are seen, truly seen, not as a site, not as a contested space or the location of conflict. I pray that you are seen for all that you are, the ancestor, the guide, the pico of our existence, our connection. And so you can see the, the passion in that, right? The, the love, the, the, the knowing of this sacred mountain as, as part of God, as the essence of God for, for these people in some ways. So anyway, so just an offering, a way for us to give back for the Thanksgiving for this wonderful practice that we are um, enjoying through these weeks together and hopefully forever. So as we move to free ourselves, I love that, that your, what was the title of your, this panel? No More Prisons. So the title, the No More Prisons, is like a freeing, right, of the self-made prisons that we have, the prisons of our own mind. So that's part of our affirmation as we close out today. I want to invite you to join me with this. Together, I am freed from my self-made prisons. I am free and unlimited. And so it is. Thank you. And thank you again to Julie. Thank you.